Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having us on the program. Uh, it's always a pleasure to kind of be here with, uh, uh, with the whole group. Um, so this is a paper that can kind of be divided in three parts. So first part, we kind of look at to what extent the kind of pre-COVID view that, you know, there was a flat Phillips curve should now either be rejected or whether it's still a kind of reasonable starting point to think about things. And we claim that it's, there's a lot of parts where a flat Phillips curve still fits the data well and kind of go through some of that. And uh, so that in addition, when you think about that, then it kind of gives you that there's the supply, supply shocks. But what we say when you look at that, it suggests expectations of inflation also played a significant role over the, the recent period. Uh, that brings us to look at a bit the joint dynamics of inflation and inflation expectations. And we're going to kind of show a bar that shows some patterns there. And again, some parts there would be very consistent also with a uh, flat Phillips curve. But we try to try to understand, can you explain this kind of joint dynamics of inflation and inflation expectation uh, with a flat Phillips curve uh, and rational expectations? We kind of find that doesn't work. So it brings us to suggest a different way of thinking about uh, inflation expectations in this type of framework. And uh, this, the general narrative here is really that people have a, a rather kind of reasonable, sophisticated view, but kind of still at the same time simple simple about how they see inflation and how they make their expectations. Basically, they think, well, you know, there might be common components. If we see prices rise in a whole bunch of sectors, that's probably inflation. And they're just extracting that and kind of putting it back in. But that creates kind of a, if there's really a broad-based shocks of inflation, so they're affecting a lot of sectors at the same time, people tend to update their inflation expectations. That gets kind of embedded in and kind of propagates, even if the kind of the, the underlying shocks, the supply shocks are actually temporary. So that's going to be the story we're going to be giving here. Uh, so to kind of start, I'll kind of go over that first piece, a few, a little bit of evidence on this uh, aspect that maybe a flat Phillips curve still seems to uh, uh, fit the data rather well. Now, there's lots of things that we do in the paper. I'll just show a few things here kind of going at it. We have both, we estimate a Phillips curve prior to COVID, actually prior even to 2008 and looking at errors. But even if we kind of take off the shelf, so not, nothing about estimation here, just taking off the shelf and kind of uh, uh, using a very, very simple uh, Phillips curve relationship where you think inflation's related to expected inflation with a big weight on that expected inflation and a kind of some kind of measure of the gap and then some supply shocks. And we're just using the kind of uh, flat estimates that Joe and his work um, has been kind of uh, suggesting. And we do this. And so what we're looking in general is kind of take this and kind of ask, if we look at this and look at it kind of over this and look at the residuals, did we kind of get a really kind of bizarre pattern over this period? And in particular, we're going to plot the residuals of this against different gap measures and seeing whether there seems to be like an increase in the slope of the Phillips curve or a kind of a uh, a uh, an ex, uh, particularly nonlinear relationship. Now, in doing this exercise, one of the things that's important is what kind of measures that you use for expected inflation. Now, most of the work that the, what I'm going to show today is going to be based on using kind of uh, household um, uh, measures versus, versus kind of professionals. And I really want to say here, you can kind of see the relationship, whether it's households or firms. Households, what's nice is we have long series going back. But during this period, households and firms kind of have these high levels, and professionals had these low ones. So that's actually an important thing, and I think maybe uh, it'll come up in kind of some discussion afterwards. But what I'll be showing is kind of like based on using uh, these household measures of expectations. And then if you do this, this is a standard part. If you take these, whether it's our estimated or off the shelf kind of Phillips curve, and you just look at the residuals over this period, and this is everything over you know, past 2008 and kind of including the, the COVIDs or the darker gray ones, and then regressing them against gaps, there really isn't much evidence of kind of steepening. We actually have a cubic here uh, relationship. It doesn't want to say there's a lot more kind of going on here. And it's kind of fitting rather well, and there's just shocks around there. Uh, now, we do it for a different aspects. So these are all kind of different parts where we're doing it either on headline inflation, core inflation, our estimated relationship, I'll call this off the shelf, or our baseline. And we're kind of getting this same pattern that there doesn't seem to be something that's suggesting that you know, over this, as we had kind of tighter things, the relationship is saying we're getting more big errors at that, uh, at that end there. Now, you can think, well, maybe we were using this as kind of the unemployment gap. A lot of people like uh, a uh, vacancy to unemployment rate. 
The same type of thing if we do it with vacancy to unemployment rate, we're not, we're not finding. If anything, we find it actually going a little bit the, the, uh, the other way. Now, again, here, this is really relying on this aspect of what you, know, what you think uh, inflation expectations are. And this is using, like I say, uh, this uh, survey of consumer finance, which I think kind of fits with the household type of things too. Now, so in this view, it kind of says, well, we kind of basically had a flat Phillips curve possibly still thinking through this. Well, if you think about that, that really means what you want to think about inflation as being kind of a lot the supply shocks and partly the inflation. And this, so these are all graphs where we take that relationship and kind of feed in the different parts of things where we cut off the supply shocks. And let me just kind of look here, kind of let's say headline versus core. And this is where we shut up the, the gap aspect, but it's very flat, so it doesn't make a much difference. What you see is like for core, the, the fitted line, this is actual inflation, this is what's fitted that's really this expectations capturing a lot of what's happening core. When you look at headline, all this would be kind of the difference. This is the difference between you know, headline and expectations. This would be all your supply shocks here. But again, expectations are potentially, now that's only approximate cause. We have to, you know, this is kind of saying you're taking out the supply shocks, but the supply shocks could be feeding into those expectations. That's what's going to work. But this is the aspect of just thinking, you kind of get, when you're thinking about this, there's a lot in expectations, there's a lot in supply. And there's not, in this view, obviously, uh, the tightness of the labor market plays uh, a kind of more minor role of thinking about this. Um, so let me go a different step to kind of uh, look about this. So it's suggesting we want to think about things in terms of how do we think of the joint determination of inflation and inflation expectations. They're probably feeding off. In order to just use a very simple kind of bivariate VAR to begin with, and in a moment I'll show a trivariate VAR, just as a description here. So I'm going to do a Kolesky decomposition. I'm not suggesting these are structural shocks here, just as I want to show a few properties that kind of come up of a bivariate VAR over a long period of understanding the relationship between expected inflation and inflation. And so this is bivariate VAR, and like I say, it's a, it kind of represents the dynamics of it by doing a Kolesky decomposition You get the information. Uh, now, there's a few things that you kind of repeatedly see here. And um, so when you're having an increase, you know, uh, that is allowed to be joint between inflation and inflation expectations, you're getting, you know, both are going up by, by structure, but you're getting a lot more. In both these cases, what you see is how much more in the very short run, inflation's much more volatile than the expectations. So some things are happening. The same thing down here, you get, you know, inflation going up and, um, the expectations kind of, you know, uh, filtering a lot out of there. What's important is once you take one period ahead, you take this line and put it on here, or this line, put it on here. It's like one period ahead, inflation, inflation expectations are very kind of similar, which is kind of suggesting either inflation expectations are really good at predicting what's happening, or in some sense, they're causing what's happening afterwards. So that's kind of the different parts here. And this is what we'll try to figure out. How can we explain this joint, uh, this joint behavior of understanding uh, the, this inflation dynamics as I'm summarizing by this, uh, uh, this VAR. Now, one of the interesting things you could have thought, well, really what we should be thinking is, you know, inflation, inflation expectations and some kind of gap measure, that's kind of our framework when you're thinking in a Phillips curve. And you can do that. And another way of seeing that the flat Phillips curve is basically the block that is inflation, inflation expectations. It's almost completely decomposed of putting in a gap and that type of thing. And actually, you can kind of test that and kind of say, does it have a kind of block recursive structure? It's almost like this is completely gap is kind of independent of this. And you get the same dynamics in the subgroup uh, over here, which is just another way of saying the data look like a lot of uh, flat Phillips curve type view in terms of, and then you really want to understand this dynamics because the other dynamics doesn't feed in very much. Um, so what we do is we kind of create ourselves a challenge. So this could be anyone could kind of pick up this challenge if you're interested. It's kind of saying, okay, how could we re can we replicate this VAR? Okay, so thinking about it, we'd like to have something that replicates with inflation and inflation expectations, where we constrain ourselves to kind of have a flat Phillips curve that looks something like this. We have some kind of gap process that we can estimate. We can kind of estimate the error terms off this as our supply shocks, and then ask, You'd want to do this. This will kind of create inflation, but you have to put in a theory of end expectations in there. So you just take this. Can you add a theory of expectations that then can replicate these VAR dynamics? And that's kind of the question. And so the first part we do in here is kind of take that and say, 
can we replicate uh, this under rational expectations and kind of think about different information sets, different ways of putting it that people might not observe this, not observe that. And what you get in general is basically these supply shocks are temporary enough that kind of like you just don't get any persistence in this type of, this type of system where repeatedly you try different types of things. You can get, you know, if you start making kind of a, assumptions on imperfect information or different parts like this, you basically get them people to filter and kind of not react as much to uh, inflation, but very quickly it just kind of comes down to zero. You're just not explaining any of the dynamics that would be jointly there in that in that system. So that's where we take the the step of saying, okay, so how how do we want to move forward on this? Is uh, like I say, here's the the challenge. Like I said, what we want to say is we want to replicate those var dynamics, constraining ourselves to be in this world where we still have a a flat Phillips curve and kind of add a theory of expectations that might kind of allow us to do that. Um, and this is where uh, we have this idea of kind of broad-based supply shocks, okay? So the idea here is actually, like I said kind of earlier on, very simple intuitively is just saying, well, what is inflation? When you go around and tell people, you know, what's the difference between a relative price change and inflation? Inflation is all prices going up at the same time and relative price changes are particular things. So it might make sense for people to think, well, how I'm going to form my expectations on inflation is just to try to extract the common component to, you know, from disaggregate data. I see data on all sorts of things. So if I go to the supermarket and I, things are going up and I go to the gas station, I go to a restaurant, and then I see everything, maybe I'll start kind of um, seeing, thinking inflation's going up. And so that's just your generalized uh, price. And so we'll be looking at that aspect of just seeing what, what would that do if you just look at disaggregate data and pull the common component, how, do, how close is it to people's expectations? And then we'll want to put that idea in, the, in a model. Okay, so the first part is just, we kind of get some disaggregated data. We get you know, all the ones that we have, uh, a whole set of series on this. So you want to think of people of potentially seeing disaggregated data as reflecting some common component that might be uh, autoregressive here. There might be some, some idiosyncratic uh, shocks to that, uh, to that system. And they're trying to infer from this, so they see a whole bunch of these and trying to infer a common component and possibly you know, just by uh, standard uh, extraction here, just uh, filtering through that, try to make their expectations. So if you take the, the disaggregated data and do this exercise, you get a series for the common component. And this is the expected inflation, and this is the common component coming out of the disaggregated data. And it, you know, it maps <laughs> pretty well in terms of kind of like what, what kind of comes out. It's just saying, if people interpret things as kind of coming out from a common component, it looks like they're, that's capturing possibly a lot of the way they might be uh, doing expectations. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this common component is some of the pieces that, you know, just looking at it, what type of uh, aspects are kind of being overweighted, let's say, relative to their weight? Because there's nothing in here. If you're kind of using and kind of extracting from the common component, it's not like you're going to be weighting things as they are in the, uh, in a, um, uh, in the basket of you know, weights off the CPI. These will just be the information weights that are kind of coming out. Some of the things are more informative about the common component. Just to give you an idea of like, so all the ones that are below this line are kind of overweighted relative to their, uh, uh, their weight in the uh, CPI. And one that's kind of like really overweighted, for example, is full service meals, basically restaurants, okay? Now restaurants are a whole bunch of things at the same time. You kind of go and you kind of see this is services, it's food, it's all these things. And that tends to be uh, really overweighted in that kind of common component. Something that's kind of highly unweighted relative to it is shelter in here. So that's kind of something that doesn't seem to, to rely. So you have this common component, and this is this idea. So that's the disaggregate data part. Now we're gonna put the idea into, the, into a model here, okay? So here we wanna think, uh, people have kind of the model I was just saying before, okay? They see this, these disaggregated things, uh, they, there's some aggregation of this that depends exactly on the CPI weights, but the way they use this is kind of something different. And there's some common aspect. Now they don't de decompose, like in this common aspect, there's many things going on. The actual data generating process is kind of like our, our Phillips curve, where the, um, the Phillips curve depends on the expected inflation, the gap, and all these uh, sectorial shocks. People are just interpreting it as this. They're inferring this part of a common component but that common component you know, will come and feed back into expectations. That's what they're, they're going to try to 
filter this out, know how much they think it's persistent, and from that kind of predict things, but that'll filter back in and affect the common component itself. Okay, and so that's the aspect. So we wanna ask, can you kinda, if you just add this, so this is like a, a theory of expectations. We're just saying, here's our theory of expectations. People are filtering data with, uh, off this common component, and that's gonna fil filter back in. And they don't, they don't recognize the full data generating process that they're actually feedback from how the whole aspect is feeding back into uh, things. That makes uh, the possibility of kind of self-fulfilling parts uh, in this. So exactly, like suppose if you have a whole bunch of broad base, you have supply shocks in a whole bunch of sectors, all of a sudden people start thinking, okay, well, there's inflation, the common components are going up. I can kind of filter out if just one price is going up, that people understand, that's a relative price change. It seems like, okay, that'll filter out. There's kind of things going across. I start thinking, ah, oh, yeah, there's a common component, that's inflation. I start thinking there's inflation, but if I start thinking there's inflation, that kind of uh, gets into expectations, ex ex expectations feedback, and you kind of get something that's kind of close to self-confirming here that kind of comes and feeds back. Now, when we're gonna bring this to the data, we're gonna try to fit, fit this, uh, but at the same time, making it that people that seeing this world, the data that's being generated from this world makes it kind of consistent that they're seeing this, yes. Um, so, so we're kind of uh, this back and forth. Uh, so what we do is we just estimate that model. That's our model of, um, of expectations that we add to that, uh, that challenge I said earlier about this aspect of saying, okay, we're keeping the, basically the data is generating by a Phillips curve. We have the, the same type of shocks there and we're just adding this part and trying to both at the same time. Now, all of a sudden you can really fit this data quite well. In addition, you kind of like, we're constraining that the moments that the people are seeing are consistent with the view that they're making, okay? And so I'll kind of show you in a second the next thing. Uh, so it really gets this aspect that there's, and now in, in our framework, now you can start interpreting this as this is this effect of this broad base shock, okay? So when you get a broad base shock, people understand, they're kind of filtering it out. It kind of moves inflation a lot. Some of that inflation gets into the expected inflation. And then the expected inflation and the inflation start moving very much together, kind of coming back down on, on that path. On the flip side, if there's a non-broad base shock, that means there's something that doesn't look like it's driving by the common component, it really goes up and just comes back down. And there's hardly any inflation that goes through that, uh, that whole process. So that's the idea that we're kind of thinking there. And like I say, if you look kind of, you know, when we, we're, we're doing this, because you could say, well, yeah, you're kind of giving your quite a bit of flexibility to map this this var, at the same time, we're kind of constraining that the, 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 the model's actually producing moments of kind of variance of inflation, covariance, and kind of second. So all the moments that you're seeing of inflation and the subjective model is exactly having those properties at the same time. So you have people that have those, those beliefs that are kind of thinking there. And like I say, it's kind of creating something that's very close to self-fulfilling. Um, now, I, I, I showed you that, um, that common component that we took from the disaggregated data, okay? In the model I just showed you, in the VAR kind of when we're trying to fit this, we're not using the disaggregated data there. This is a latent variable in that kind of model, but we can extract it what we're saying people are actually inferring in that, in that part. And this is plotting one against each other. So one is the common component ab observed when we're just doing a filtering process on the, um, on the uh, disaggregated data, which we said it looks a lot like what it looks like expectations. And this is the part that comes from the model of kind of doing it from estimating this model. And you kind of get something that's actually tightly linked. It seems that this common component might be a way of kind of thinking about how, uh, um, how things are. So let me kind of conclude with that. So here, what are we proposing? We're proposing kind of a, a view of the inflation that's really based on supply shocks, but you don't want to think about supply shocks of all being equal. There's really this difference of kind of like, there's supply shocks in a lot of sectors. People kind of interpret that as kind of inflation starting up. Supply shocks in one sector, it's kind of like, okay, uh, people can filter that out. What happens is if it is at this broad base, then it affects uh, expectations and starts kind of creating this, uh, this dynamics, this persistence through this short run de-anchoring of expectations get the process. Now, what we like about it or what we kind of you know, find is this is consistent. So this story kind of matches, you can think about the world with it's still this flat Phillips curve. You can match the, uh, the VAR dynamics for inflation and expected inflation. And uh, this is relying on this behavioral assumption in terms of the, uh, 
the perceived law of motion that people see for inflation is a bit different than the actual, but it's very close to rational expectations in the sense that given the moments they see, this is a kind of reasonable kind of process to kind of think through. Okay, thank you. Leave it there.